What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting from the UK and across the world online, you're now watching the UK's only alternative late night talk show, and I'm your host, Kevin Moore. For the next hour, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Rick Lindell. Now, Rick holds a doctorate in clinical psychology and is a member of the Ontario Psychological Association. Now, he maintains a private practice in Bowmanville, Ontario, Canada and offers cognitive behavioral psychotherapy coupled with existential and spiritual therapy techniques including past life regression, life between life regression, and entity releasement. Now he joins me today to discuss his latest book, The Purpose, Your Soul's Emotional Journey. Rick Lindell, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is great to have you on, Rick. It really is. And um, I, I was just thinking to myself earlier on, I was like, how did we get in con contact with each other? But this is a, I'm so glad we did because, again, another, another guest coming on with a really fascinating book. Now, uh, your book is called, if I get the right piece of paper in front of me, uh, The Purpose, Your Soul's Emotional Journey, Learning How to Experience Life Through a Different Lens. Right. Very interesting. Um, how, how quick was the process in writing, the, writing this book? Um, it took exactly nine months. Nine uh, months? From beginning to end. And, uh, uh, and then a few months of editing and, you know, uh, polishing it up, but it, it's sort of like a, like a gestation period, you know, it uh, worked out that way. Yes. And, uh, yeah. You, you know, I had a guest, in, uh, guest on yesterday um, that, that had a, a degree in uh, clinical psychology as well, well, in psychology. And it's, it's, it's quite incredible the amount of people that do go into psychology that do sometimes enter in, into the realm of are we when we look in our in the mirror and we see that reflection in the mirror 
and to be aware of that reflection. Where is that awareness coming from? Is it just a creation of the brain? Or is that I amness, has it always existed, yet, yet we cannot remember that we had a life before this? Right, right. Yeah, um, and certainly in my profession as a psychologist, uh, psychologists shy away from this area and they like to uh, uh, concentrate on the scientific aspects of the discipline and, uh, and to talk about consciousness. It's sort of uh, a bit sort of sketchy. Uh, or it's considered sort of a bit sketchy by many psychologists. So, uh, but uh, you know, it's been something that has sort of evolved with me for many years, and um, I, 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 I suppose it starts when I'm a, I'm a child, and um, uh, I was playing the Ouija board with my mother, who was interested in these issues, and um, and. Uh, then I read everything that I could on parapsychology. It became my hobby, and uh, I started uh, after with the Ouija board. Uh, we used to play it normally, the two of us. And then I discovered that, or my mom told me that my brother's father used to play it on his own up at the farm in north in the north of Iceland. So I said, "Oh, that's good." So I started doing that too, and uh, and then it became so. I became so fast at it and the thoughts appeared in my head so quickly that I just decided to write them down. So it sort of became more well, an automatic writing where I would ask a question and I would write it down. And so I, I went on doing this for a few years um, until sort of the end of my stay in England back in, in the... W were you scared of doing that on your own at all? Was it a scary process? And did it did it actually move? Did you feel it moving? And it, it was more than you that was moving it. No, it felt like it was moving, um, and it would sometimes fly off, fly off the the table. You know, when I was doing using the uh, the little uh, thingy that moves around. But once I was writing, it was a lot more sort of um, automatic, as it were. And of course, being a psychologist and studying science, I was uh, studying psychophysiology, um, I, I, I was skeptical of this, you know, what is this, what's going on here? Yes. So, and when I was um, communicating on the Ouija board, I was always communicating either with my maternal grandmother or my, or my, my grandfather uh, on, my, on my mother's side. And uh, um, so I said to him, I said, you know, Edward, he had died a few years uh, ago, uh, and I said, you know, I don't believe any of this bull, you know, what is this? You know, I'm a scientist, I'm starting to be a psychologist, I can't be dabbling in these things unless you give me some proof. So he said, well, hey, um, think about your, your, your dad and what he's doing right now. And I was in England at York University at the time, and my dad was in Iceland, in Reykjavik, uh, at his office, sitting at his desk. Uh, well, my grandfather said, your dad's at his office sitting at a desk and he's going to get up in a few minutes as he, and he's going to drive home uh, for supper and on his way home there will uh, be an accident and uh, he will observe the accident, he won't be involved in the accident and then he'll go home and he'll tell his wife about it. So I said, okay, and, uh, and he said, well, call your dad tomorrow and, uh, and ask him um, what happened. So I did, and turns out exactly that that happened. So uh, I started thinking, hmm, uh, I think I believe this. I mean, it's impossible for me to have... That's incredible. That's incredible. And did you ever bring any information through via the, via that, the Ouija board uh, in the sense of... Um, uh, uh, what the continuation of the soul is, where where the where the where they felt they were, and just just concepts that were not not known to you in a sense. Uh, not really. Um, you know, it was. You know, how how did you know it it was who it was it saying it was? How do you know that it was authentic and? Um, I I felt I suppose I felt it was my grandfather. Okay. Uh, uh, if it was my my grandmother, uh, she was actually my mater my maternal grandmother. Sorry, and uh, but she was a very different character, and totally different, and spoke differently, or or, 
said words differently. She felt very different, and and I only sort of communicated with these two people. Right. And Did anything negative come through on the board? No, never. Uh, uh, if there was anything negative that wanted to come through, or a person I didn't know, I uh, blocked them. Uh, uh. So. I was conscious, so, and uh, you know, I didn't want to sort of get into, uh, uh, you know, t a trickery or or, or 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 entities that that yes. might have my best interest in heart, you know. Okay, very interesting and very interesting. And um, um, d d was there any sort of a unusual activity in the house once you had done that that, or was it all sort of good on the Western Front? All good. No, oh, nothing. Good. I felt, in fact, very supported wow. by having my grandfather sort of uh, guide me in a sense. Uh, I felt, and um, and I like that. Uh, it was a wonderful relationship, and still is. If I pick up the pen, I can do it. Do I can, he's always there. Do you do you still do your creative writing or the or the or the board? Uh, no, I haven't done it for many years. Okay. I haven't done it since the mid '80s. Um, so, had you had you read? The Seth books prior to doing the board or after doing the board? Uh, after started in the mid '80s, maybe uh, late '80s. I started reading the Seth books, and um, and then uh, you know uh, Donald Wells, Neil Donald Wells's conversations with God, and uh, and, uh, and then later Viktor Frankl, um, existential sort of uh, philosophy and, and psychotherapies. In incredible. So, so, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the the Seth material is great material, as as there is a lot of great material out there right now, right? Um, but yeah, Seth, yeah, 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 Seth did actually pave the way for a lot of other channels to come through. Um, it definitely did. Um, it, it sends shivers down my spine talking about it because you've had the, the, that all sort of authentic connection. Um, how, how comes that you you know you you sort of stopped the creative writing? Um, I, I, I just got busy and uh, I didn't think there was there wasn't a lot coming through I didn't have many questions I somehow felt I knew everything I needed to know about the other side and uh, and my grandfather said hey you know I said well why don't I channel a book through you or something or, you know and uh, and he said don't worry there's a lot been written already you know just look around and you'll find it so I started looking around, and that's when I discovered the Seth material, and um, and so after having read that and many other books, you know, I realized, you know, there's, you know, I, there's no need to reinvent the the wheel, as it were, uh, you know. No, no, but there there always seems to be in in the channel material coming through now new frameworks of information coming through, new right. frameworks. Yeah. Yeah. No, whether yeah. whether whether it helps to heal the everyday problems that we go through, maybe not. But it is, you know, really on the cutting edge. Some of it. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I had a thought and it it escaped me. But uh, you, you're right. I mean, I suppose the issue I had with at the time and when I was writing before I wrote the book was that I had spent a few years trying to explain these concepts to my my friends and, and to my patients and um, it was difficult to weave these in and uh, suggesting that they read you know the Seth material somehow seemed too convoluted and complicated for many of them so uh, that was one of the reasons I decided well I think I'll see if I can put all of these concepts together in a in a whole that that is Easily understood and can be used as a as an aid uh, to a person sort of exploring their their universe and their their their, their spirituality uh, together with the psycho the process of psychotherapy. So that was the sort of the motivation behind putting this together in that way. So. Well, you've done a wonderful job on the book. You really, really have, and we're going to get into the book as well, uh, most definitely. Um, how did you go from, you know, finishing your, your, your uh, clinical degree and eventually moving in to embrace 
past life regression, life between life regression, and other um, even even you know spirit spirit attachment therapy into your practice. How much trust was that in you to go down that road? Um, it seemed just the natural course because that is the way it is, and so why not? It you know educate people and my clients about that because the problem with a lot of uh, the psychotherapy techniques that are used in my opinion uh, are that they disregard the spiritual or the even the existential perspectives on life and the psychologists will often try and focus in on a very specific aspect and then sort of deal with that uh, but you can't really separate a person, you can't separate them and deal and fix one portion and expect the other one to be fixed at the same time. You sort of have to look at the whole picture and, and in order to integrate whatever you're trying to do, uh, you have to include the whole person and that includes their, their ontology, their existential perspectives, but also the spirituality. And, uh, and that's what I found is that for those people that are have a receptive to these ideas or even just some of these ideas it really opens up a, a whole new frame of, of looking at themselves in the world and the reasons for their problems because as you know I say in the book hey one of the well I say we live here uh, in the physical world but we also are simultaneously existing in the spiritual dimension and and we always have this connection but then I say, the reason for us being here, of course, is to experience um, uh, negative emotions or painful emotions, and um, and that's a part of life. So when a client comes to me and say, "Well, you know, I'm having all these problems," I say, "Well, of course you're having problems. You're living fully. You're living fully in life. You should have problems. If you're not having problems, you should come and see me." So, to a degree, that. you know, that sort of validates for the client say well I thought I I'm a I have a I'm a patho I have a pathology I thought I'm ill I said well maybe if it's if if you're not able to pull yourself out of these problems I can help you uh, but it's normal to have problems and to have crises and that's how life is it's a it's a series of ups and downs and we discover ourselves through these experiences in hindsight when we bestow meaning on the events that have happened in the past and and they define us and, th and this is how spiritual growth happens. So you have no choice but to go through the ups and downs in life and, and hey, uh, so that takes care of some of the sort of um, uh, upset a client would sometimes have. They'd say, oh wow, I didn't realize this was normal. And uh, because everyone else says I'm ill, <laughs> so uh, you know. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, of course as a as a therapist, uh, they 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 feel much better more quickly. So uh, there is less revenue for me, <laughs> but that's okay. I have more clients coming through. Uh, as they get better. Yeah. How long have you been doing th this for as well? Uh, doing uh, as a, working as a psychologist? Yes, and or, and yes, working oh. as a psychologist and embracing the, the therapy that you do now. Um, I think mainly really it started when I began sort of my private practice in the early 90s uh, and until then I was uh, you know, thinking about these issues and, and suggesting some of them to clients. But, you know, I say in the early 90s and uh, in the area when, uh, you know, when the AIDS epidemic was, uh, was in full force and I worked a lot with people with HIV and AIDS and, uh, and they were uh, interested in these issues. You know, there was Louise Hay um, uh, that uh, had written about uh, the spirituality of dying and, and life. And uh, uh, 
Kugler-Ross that had written about death and dying and uh, so there were these sort of issues and then uh, Conversations with God uh, came out and uh, uh, various other books and, and so the whole culture where I was was sort of steeped in these, uh, these ideas and issues and, and they gradually started formulating for me a, a sort of uh, an approach to therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and have you had um, people come to your practice that were, you know, ha had their sort of due date when they were with, with the pretty sure that they were not going to live for too long because of medical issues, maybe AIDS or, you know, whatever it may be where they, you know, um, uh, were dying, basically. Um, what was that like for them if they came in to, to, to go through some of your therapies? Did they get to experience the, the levels and the, the mm, place where they were going to go to, in a sense? Uh, yeah, I think some of them did. Um, and, and they all wanted to. And, um, um, uh, yeah, I had, have, I had many clients that, that, that died uh, from from AIDS and uh, um, most of them were at peace with that and, and, and knew that they would continue to exist. They had, many of them had read these books and were familiar with them. I wasn't, um, I hadn't formulated a sort of a specific therapy technique at the time that, uh, you know, was implementing their shift so much but you know I would put in snippets hey you know things happen for a reason uh, you do exist outside of this dimension you know you never die uh, things like that and, and slowly the uh, yeah um, it, it helped them guide, guide them along their way absolutely absolutely and and you know uh, were some of the majority of people that had AIDS were 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 they um, um, were they gay in it? You know, a, a lot of the clients. Uh, yeah, I suppose most of them were. Um, uh, I worked in a clinic for HIV-related concerns at uh, the Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, and then later in Iceland, I was uh, a director of the AIDS Association there right. for a few months. No, no. Uh, yeah, the reason I mention that is because in your book you talk about coming out and sexuality, so there's healing with the work of in what you do in, in that aspect as well. Uh, yeah. Um, not to say there's anything wrong with being gay. I'm not saying that, but it, it, it answers why that you feel that way. Right. Well, I, I I thought it was important in the in my book and in in my therapy approach to to be authentic and to be unapologetic for my existence, which is what my message is in the book, is that uh, you're unique and therefore you're irreplaceable. And it's a, a quality and a requirement of your existence to be who you are in order for, for yourself, but also in order for others to learn. So, um, and that's taking a step away from the traditional therapist approach where, you know, the therapist reveals something about themselves and to the degree that I have in the book that uh, I think works well. I'm trying to sort of sort of lessen the myth of the, the you know, the doctor in the white coat who, who uh, you know, has a stiff upper lip and doesn't tell you, tell you much or anything about themselves in order uh, not to, well, I'm not sure why. Uh, but it has to do with transference and counter-transference, obviously. But uh, uh, there's, a, a, I think, um, it's quite valid and, and, and necessary, and it's a more of a human approach to share a part of yourself uh, in that way. Of course, uh, one has to be careful what one shares. For example, if a client is having a relationship problem, and I'm having a relationship problem at the same time, yeah. I don't want to be talking about my issues. Right. Or, let, or or in or, or in in the in a way that would interfere with them exploring their own. Of know, course, has to do with the of course. Who taught you the the process uh, for life between life regression and past life regression? Um, I I um, took a number of courses. Um, uh, I suppose um, Michael Newton, I, I did the Life Between Life Regression sort of course with him. Um, 
and uh, there was uh, Adam Crabtree in Toronto. He's written a couple of books uh, on on this regression and and on 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 entities and things like that. And so I took some courses with him. So yeah. Uh, uh, okay. And, okay. So that's where you get. Yeah. That's where, you, that's where you got the training from. Um, uh, the, thank you for, for sharing that, by the way. Yeah, Michael New, Newton, what, what, what a, what a, that must have been an interesting course, uh, definitely. Um, wow, there's so much to talk about in, in your book as well. Now, now in, in the title, you use the word emotional. And um, do, do you think, and when it, in the book as well, chapter seven, you know, you talk about emotional states of, of mind and their effect on, on uh, you know, your reality, your love, your fear and anxiety. Um, do you think the emotional healing aspect is missed out in, in, in mainstream psychology, in a sense, that, that emotional healing part aspect? Um, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, the approach is often a very cognitive one from the psychologist's perspective, but of course they're dealing with emotions. Um, um, I, I, my angle is that, hey, life is all about emotions and really that's all it is about it doesn't matter what you do in life um, your station in life um, what you accomplish what you don't accomplish these are uh, states that or, or situations that bring you to a, a place where you can have particular emotions but it's all about learning from the emotional experiences that you have and uh, so everyone is equal in that sense. There's no, uh, no one is better than another person. And uh, so, uh, my focus is is all about the emotions. It's like you know, what, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I'm more emotionally anchored uh, in my therapy than most ther psychologists are. But that's not true for everyone. I'm sure. That's very interesting. So, so if we're suffering from depression, for example, um, is that an easy one? Is that something we can easily fix ourselves, or do we have to go through it to experience it to be able to come out on the other side? And um, yeah, and I heal think that? it's uh, you need to go through it. You're having it for a reason, and um, it's important to go through the depths that that emotion takes you and uh, and and it's it's a healthy reaction to feel depressed in some situations um, it's only when you've been depressed for so long and you can't pull yourself out of it that you need uh, you know some guidance and how to do that and maybe a perspective on on why the context of why you're feeling depressed what does what is the meaning of that why why am I suffering in this way and uh, um, so it's part of life. Uh, yeah. yeah. I haven't met a person yet that hasn't had periods of of depression. Uh, maybe not clinical depression, but certainly. Yes, ab absolutely. So, so um, yeah. obviously, um, how, how many clients that you, that you see? Uh, it, 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 if you could break it down, sort of, you know, have the past life regression work with yourselves, or the life between lives uh, work, and and what qualifies to to go into those areas? Is it depending on on you know? I mean, could a past life regression? I'm supposing could fix um, depression as well, couldn't it? Uh, yeah, occasionally I've had uh, clients, especially uh, ones that I've had. An, an anxiety about something or a physical pain about something, a fear, uh, where a past life regression has cured that, uh, that phenomena in, 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 in 40 minutes. Uh, I had a client once, uh, she had suffered from severe anxiety and panic attacks and been hospitalized on numerous occasions. Uh, and uh, she came to see me and uh, I saw her for I think it was an hour and she did a past life, we did a past life regression with her and the anxiety was she could identify the origin of it and let it release it and uh, this is, must be about 
20 years ago and she hasn't had an anxiety or panic attack since. Incredible. Um, I've had other, uh, I've had another client who had a different sort of experience where this was an entity attachment. So um, he had come across uh, when he was a teenager a, a person who died on a boat and helped this person uh, ashore or the, and um, thought nothing of it. And then uh, later in life, he, uh, he uh, started having problems with uh, jealousy. Uh, to the extent that he couldn't maintain any relationships. I guess, you know, a couple of weeks into the relationship, you know, he became insanely jealous. And there was, in exploring this issue with him uh, in therapy over a number of sessions, there was no, no obvious cause for that. And, um, and he didn't believe in past life or in entity, like this was a technology guy and uh, you know, thought this was just rubbish, but he said, "Hey, Rick, if you uh, if you want to do that, then that's fine. I'm, I I I'm, I want to find a way of releasing this." So he goes into a into a into a trance, and uh, and suddenly this guy in the boat appears for him, standing right in front of him in the room, as he described it. And uh, the guy in the boat said, "Well, what am I doing here?" And uh, and he said, "Well, you died, like." way back in the I think, 70s and, and he says, well, what, where have I been, says the dead guy. And, uh, and so we explain and uh, say, hey, you know, you've been attached to this person and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the person that died says, well, where's my wife? I'm going to go home and see my wife. And she's, well, you know, she's obviously passed into the uh, spiritual dimension, but, you know, we can ask her to come and, and uh, maybe she'll guide you there. And so I did and uh, she appeared. and. Uh, and uh, took him, she appeared actually in a car <laughs> that he recognized and they drove off into the spiritual dimension but I said to my client, hey, ask him before he leaves if he used to be jealous in his lifetime and, uh, and he says, yes, I've always been insanely jealous, you know, and, uh, and so we did then this releasement, you know, said, well, you know, this jealousy, you need to take that with you, this energy that is the jealousy, you must take it with you uh, because it's been affecting, uh, you know, my client, and uh, and this uh, gentleman was very apologetic. You know, I didn't realize, I didn't know what was happening. All this is, I'm so sorry. He takes the jealousy symbolically, um, and leaves. And my client, he hasn't been jealous for it must be 15, 16 years now. It's gone. So in one session, sometimes. Uh, something like that can work if it has, if it, ha it when it's you know a spiritual, uh, dimensionally uh, sort of connected issue. That's incredible. Do you find um, do you find with clients that um, past lives um, are affecting the current incarnation sometimes quite seriously in a sense of habits and feelings that they cannot explain they they've never really lived a life to to have these feelings or habits yet they're there you when you go into the regression um it becomes clear that in a past life you didn't heal what you've brought forth in this life yeah it, it, that's right occasionally it does and i certainly i talk about one aspect of that in my book about the fear of water, for example, you know. Um, uh, so uh, that happens, uh, but also um, I don't believe in karma as as maybe the uh, the Buddhist religion would do. Like it's the idea is that if you do something bad in this life, it's gonna you know you're gonna have to go through it in a, in a different incarnation. No, there seems to be free will. Yeah, yeah. But rather, you know, you come into this life uh, fully aware of, of most of the issues that you, you have decided to deal with, and it's your choice to do that, and that's why you have the, the upsets in, the, in this current lifetime, but they have nothing to do with what you did in a past life, because on a spiritual level, of course, there is no good and bad, there is no right or wrong, um, we're all connected with in all that is on a spiritual level so but down here obviously there there is morality and values and rights and wrongs and and this creates the emotions that we need to have in order to to 
to discover who we are. But if we've got had people in our life that we would call our worst enemies or that have caused the, 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 the most pain to us or continue to disrupt, disrupt our life, do you think they could be our greatest teacher in the sense that we potentially chose to have this experience with them? Not the exact experience, but to, you know, to be coming together again to, to, to work things out that we've you know, still not worked out in previous lives. So not karma, but just the, you know, unfinished business. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That, I think that happens, happens quite often. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of some example, nothing comes to mind at the moment, but I think it, it's, we all, we all learn from each other. Everything is contrast in, in our physical world. And, and we need to have that in order to discover in order to know if you're a good person, you have to know someone that's bad. In order to be rich, you have to know what it is to be poor or know somebody that doesn't have what you have. It's all contrast. So, uh, others, we all, I am a gift to you as you are a gift to me. For each of us, for our, for our own reasons, uh, our own journeys. So we all learn from each other. And it's so important. It's it's so incredibly re uh, entangled and so perfectly worked out, isn't it? Sometimes. <laughs> um, it's not. Yeah. Do you do you find that future lives have affected any clients where something in the future life is affecting the current incarnation? Uh, I haven't uh, gone there or explored that, um, um, so I don't I don't know. Uh, uh, from the Seth uh, material, you know, Seth would say uh, there are probable futures and there is, he talks about probable man in other dimensions and, and for us we have probable futures as we also have parallel lives and that's another issue. that. Yes, uh, if, if you think that all lives are happening simultaneously, past, present and future, uh, then are those future lives potential, or are they actual? Yet there are they are uh, changeable Th effects that you cha what what you change here now would change the future, but it doesn't take away that those future lives are happening. Um, I think, uh, as far as I I can sort of glean, uh, the there is a probable future, and there are probable future lives. Uh, we have free will and down here, but we also in the on the spiritual level and uh, have see the whole picture and and so we're evolving uh, so the and it's difficult because of course here we are uh, stuck in a in a in a the space and time dimension and we can only think linearly. Uh, we can only string our words out one after the other in time, whereas on another level and on the spiritual level, of course, we have thought, we communicate through thought, and that takes no time. So it's... So it's true. Uh, so in our uh, physical universe, in our space-time dimension, there is no future, of course, in our space-time dimension. I think it's a bit of a misnomer to talk about a future, because the future we're pulling from outside our dimension into ours through the, I call it the unfolding harmony. Um, and, uh, and as we are in the moment and experience the moment, it passes and the past becomes history. And, uh, and that history reflects back on us, but it's, it's, uh, we're always in the moment. The, the power is in the moment uh, for us. Uh, and that's where we make decisions. And mm. do do a lot of your clients that come to you are, are they do they have the, they haven't really surrendered to present moment, have they? They're they're either living in the future or living in the past. Sometimes, aren't they? Uh, yeah, usually in the in the past, uh, uh, or they're they're struggling with past experiences that they can't work through. Um, now. Of course, the change is always in the moment. So every time you think about your past, you're actually changing the past because 
we're always changing. We're not stagnant. The world isn't stagnant. Our our development isn't stagnant. So therapy, in a sense, works that way. Is is by you exploring some aspects of your past, you change them every time you revisit them. And you can change them to become less painful, or you can change them to become more painful, to become more problematic than they were originally. Uh, hmm. So, you know, so in order to change them to be less problematic, you need to draw from the probable, probable future you may have you, that you siphoned into this world through the unfolding harmon harmony and uh, and that's how you move forward uh, you, you evolve uh, and you can work through I talk about transcending the the emotional states that are holding you back yeah, yeah it, um, I, I completely agree and um, yeah, learning to surrender to whatever is right now is a difficult thing sometimes, isn't it? Just to surrender to whatever's going on in our life at this current moment. But it, it does allow you to become at peace instantaneously. That's right. And, and part of the, part of the, uh, the message uh, that I'm suggesting is, hey, um, life is about ups and downs. Uh, that's often new information for people. Uh, they never thought of it that way. And once you think of it that way, well, you look around and you realize just about everybody you know has their ups and downs, and uh, it's normal and it's okay to have them, uh, to be anxious, to, and you need to, ha and you're here to have these experiences. After all, it's an indication that you're living fully, yes. that you are going through it, and sometimes you need help through it, but uh, it's okay. Uh, the, with the one caveat, and I mention often in the book, is that while these emotions are strong and overwhelming, your divine challenge is not to hurt yourself or to hurt others, especially not to kill yourself and not to kill others uh, when, you, when you have these strong emotions. And uh, most people, many people, of course, falter on that one and look around the world. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so, so, yeah, okay. We're not here to hurt ourselves or hurt others. Right. That's very important to take away from this interview today, uh, yeah. especially the one with us. Well, the, the about yourself as well, because we, you know, we tend to do that to ourselves quite easily. Hurt ourselves, and could could that be by just not being true to ourselves as well? Yeah, and it's sometimes the process of discovery. Uh, we need to. Uh, uh, this is a Neil Donald Wells's uh, phrase: to to be who you are not in order to discover who you are. Sometimes you do things that you know are not who you are or uncharacteristic of you. But once you've done them, you look back and say, you know, that wasn't me at all. And now I know better who I am. But unless you did it, you. Uh, so it's a discovery through that feeling you have afterwards of regret or remorse, sometimes of course you're forced to do things that that are not you. For example, if you conscript it to the army or in a war, you're you're forced to That's right. uh, you're forced to, to kill, kill other people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you know, if someone you do have the right though, if someone was gonna take your life we talk about we're not here to hurt ourselves or others, but if someone's gonna take take your life, you do have the right to take theirs, you know, if, if it's in self-defense, I, I do believe. Um, well, we never die anyway. That is true. So, um, it's, it's uh, I don't know what it's right, there is no right or wrong spiritually. The person who is, you know, pointing the gun at you and uh, uh, is he a bad person? Uh, or is it giving you the opportunity to experience how it is to have a gun pointed at you? And if he pulls the trigger, then you die, and your journey is, is pretty beautiful from then on. Uh, of course, the person pulling the trigger has to suffer from having, having killed someone, which isn't an easy thing to do. So, to kill in self-defense, I don't know, it's a complicated one, isn't it? 
It, it is. It really is. Um, yeah. Um, Theoretically, I'd say, you know, yeah, no, I would, wouldn't kill. I'm a pacifist. I wouldn't kill a person, even in self-defense. But um, I don't think, I'm not sure if I could resist that. Yes, if it, it put to the test. But like you say, you know, there is no wrong or right. There is no karma as we understand it. But then, what is karma to you then? Uh, there is no karma uh, other than the experience you have in a lifetime some of which you work through and some of which you don't, some of which you bring back, as you mentioned, uh, and continue to work on. But karma implies to me that there is, it's a, you, it's a consequence of, of past actions that you no. are working through. Yeah, so, so there's many books on karma out there, as you know, um, yeah. but your understanding of karma if I try to sum it up, is which is which I do agree with, is uh, in a sense that um, there is no uh, accumulation of if you've done something wrong to hurt someone in this life unconsciously or consciously, you know you don't you don't have to come back and be punished. There is nothing like that. But you may choose with free will and complete self awareness that well let me experience what that would be like on the other foot. Let's just experience that because I choose to with free will, not because I'm forced by some spirit guide to come down here to do that. Right, exactly. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 So life is all about learning and from different angles, from different perspectives. You know, you're the teacher, you're the student, you're the murderer, you're the victim, you're the aggressor, you're the pacifist. It's, it's all... Uh, we are here to learn through experience and the emotions that are created as a consequence. But what about those people who abuse other people, even child abusers? Um, why, why would you come down with that uh, urge or that, or, or, or to want to experience something like that? Because how rewarding, in a sense, spiritually is that for you as a soul? I, I can, you know. I suppose what you're going to say is that the the victim chose to be the victim and the abuser chose to be the abuser. Is that what you might say? I, I, that's what I would say. It's a controversial topic, uh, uh, of course, um, and uh, a, a, a very painful experience for uh, for the victim and for the victor or for the abuser. I think sometimes, yeah. of course, in child sexual abuse. Um, um, it's a complicated one. More often than not, of course, the abuser is a pedophile uh, who genuinely is attracted to the child uh, in a, from their perspective, in a loving way. Um, but, of course, the consequences of their acts with the child create havoc. Uh, so it's a terrible uh, situation or affliction to have, like, like you might say, I'm gay, and people will say, well, that's a terrible affliction. Well, I certainly wouldn't be traveling around Moscow waving my flag at no, the moment. No, no. Um, or Kenya. <laughs> no, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, but the so child sexual abuse. That's it's um, it's even more, I think, dramatically complicated and painful to deal with, but uh, in order, say that you wanted to experience how it felt to be abused and the consequences of that, I mean, that's a journey through life that is uh, unique, uh, that uh, to us is abhorrent. But of course, of course, and, and have you had clients that have come to you that have had past life regression that have gone through abuse, that have, that have gone to see a bigger picture of, of their own choice of coming down here? Have, have they got to see that? Uh, not that I recall specifically that right. way, but I've certainly had clients that have been sexually abused in past lives that they, they recall. Um, not this uh, life, but past lives. Yeah, in past lives, yeah. And I've, I, and I've worked with clients, of course, in this life that have been sexually abused, many. Uh, uh, some of which 
um, they fall into maybe three categories. Is the one that is genuinely sexually abused and it was a violent and a dreadful experience. Uh, there are others that think nothing of it. It didn't affect them one way or another. And then there are those that talk about it being uh, uh, one of the most loving relationships they had as children. Uh, difficult to to think of that, but I, I had once a client that was a priest who whose who, whose experience was as a child um, uh, the best that was the most loving relationship he had as a child, uh, which then of course begs the question: you know, what was what were the parents like? Where were the parents? Yeah. But that's another issue. So. Yeah. Uh, sexual abuse is very complicated, uh, yeah. how a person experiences it, and, and sometimes there could be abuse that the the child thinks very little of, but then later in life or they discover that this was abuse, and they thought they suddenly feel abused, but they didn't feel abused until it's been labeled as such, and that's another Another dimension. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I mention it because I'm sure that you know, in your practice, um, when we talk about healings, then you know, people come with all sorts of hidden scars, and um, I, I, I've done, you know, dealt, you know, had people who have been abused on on in, on in my show as well, and it's it's just just interesting to ask you if, with the type of work and healing that you do as well, the modalities that you do, just where that fits in and how how healing that is. But it's interesting when you say the past life um, abuse, you know. I, I'm guessing what you mean there is, is, it, is in this life they they have issues that relate to that past life abuse abuse. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, okay. It's uh, it's also the whole uh, dimension of, of values and morals as they change through time. I often use the example of Loretta Lynn, you know, the coal miner's daughter uh, in the states. She was married to at 16, I believe. Uh, was it 14 or 30? I can't remember. She was in the teens to a 35-year-old uh, gentleman who was a, a coal miner too. But that was common in the 60s. Now, that person would be put in prison if he, uh, a 35-year-old were to marry a 14-year-old. I mean, it just wouldn't be allowed. Absolutely. So, so, what has happened? Well, the morals and values of, of the culture have shifted just in this very short period of time, and and it's it's true with 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 abuse in this sense. Uh, in our Western society, our values have shifted very much in, in a of short course. period of time. And then we look around in other countries um, where these abuses are still happening, and we ask the people, you know, don't you think this is abuse? And they will sometimes say, no, well, what's wrong with that? This is how we've always done it. Yeah. Uh, this is the way it's supposed to be, or there's nothing wrong with that. So it's a very complicated issue. Of course it is. No, of course it is. And I, I, know, I know time's not on our side here at all, and I appreciate you sharing that as well. Um, the life between life aspect as well, for, or the intra-life, what is that like for people experiencing having a life between life session with yourself? Um, it usually um, it's 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 a, quite a profound uh, experience people have, and the questions they they're usually looking for in life between lives regression and is is uh, to to crystallize and clarify for themselves what their purpose is in this current life. You know, what am I to work on? Why am I? You know, what is this about? You know, what are why did I choose to come into this life? And um, um, following a life between life regression, there is often a, a huge uh, shift, sometimes almost you know a tectonic shift within a person, where they they feel they can now understand the big picture in a better sense, and they feel more comfortable with with the tr struggles they've had. So, it's um, it's it, it it it's it's a very powerful technique. Not everyone is, of course, uh, amiable or willing to have a life between life regression. A lot of people are, are very uncomfortable with even having a past life regression. So, 
as a therapist, I, I'm very, very conscious and careful with who I, with exploring these ideas and issues with the clients. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, very, very interesting. Um, uh, what, what, uh, have you, in a past, in a, in a life between life or even past life regression, interacted with something that was there in the sense of a spirit guide or, or an elevated, a, a sort of master spirit guide as well, in the sense where you've been able to communicate through the patient? Uh, no, no, I haven't. No, I haven't done that or been able to do that. It's not, no. I, I wish I could, but <laughs> I haven't. Has, have, were there any cases that, that you've done uh, that were really sort of um, amazing, in a sense, in, in, the, in the information that came through? Um, I don't recall, you know, for the client, they're always amazing. Um, uh, and they, they center around purpose meaning for existence uh, and the big picture and and I think um, the uh, it, it's one thing reading about what a life between life regression might be or even a past life regression might be but it's another thing experiencing it because once you experience it it stops being a belief uh, and it becomes a knowing uh, something you know uh, and the, people, you know, often don't believe these that that a past life exists, or that yeah. the, you can access the interlife. But once you've been there and you've had the experience, it's unknowing, and that knowing uh, stays with with the person and shifts their spiritual perspective and existential perspective on, on how they understand themselves in life and their journey through life. And it's very powerful in that sense from a therapeutic perspective. Absolutely, I'm back at, yeah, it is, it really is. I, I've had my own experience as well with that. Now, do, do you offer, do, pay, do clients come to you, can they come to you remotely um, via Skype or is it just um, in, in person that you, that you do this? Uh, it, just in person. Uh, uh, I haven't done any therapy over, over Skype uh, unfortunately, at my home, I don't have a good Skype connection, but I suppose I could do it in the office. I, mean, I haven't really gone there to explore that, but that's an interesting, an interesting uh, avenue, you know, to pursue. Yes, uh, yes. No, it's it's, uh, it's uh, there's a few few people doing it right now. Well, we've been putting your book up a number of times on the screen as well. And um, um, what what would you? Oh, your website as well. What is your website there, Rick? It would be. Uh, I suppose uh, thepurpose.ca, www.thepurpose.ca. Excellent. Okay. Well, what would you say? Um, what would you say is the most important message in in the work that you've done? I think um, it is the message that we exist simultaneously in the spiritual dimension and down here on earth and that we communicate with our spiritual higher self with I call it the old soul or the oversoul through intuition and our intuition can guide us throughout life and that it's very important uh, to have an open channel to the intuition uh, because of course if you don't uh, if you lose that connection uh, you uh, start experiencing some existential desperation uh, because you have a feeling nevertheless that you want to do something useful with your life and what happens then is that people start looking around maybe to institutions you know political religious or scientific institutions to tell them how to think and what uh, how to be in the world and what the world is about whereas if they were only to open themselves to their oversoul their own intuition communication with their oversoul they would not need to uh, become married to institutions and leaders that tell you how to think and what to do so that's one aspect um, another aspect of course is this idea that 
you know, life is grim. Um, uh, it's a series of ups and downs, uh, and for some people it seems like more of a series of downs than ups. Um, uh, uh, but that is the way it's supposed to be, and we're here for specifically for that purpose. So my message would be that if you're living an, an, a life that is topsy turvy, you know, congratulations, uh, you're doing really well in life, and don't feel badly uh, that your emotions take you on a roller coaster. Uh, however, you know, if uh, if you can't get out of the slump. Or can't get out of the anxiety, then you know, you know, come and see a therapist, and maybe they can, they can help you uh, out of that. Uh, um, so I suppose those would be the two sort of main thrusts of, of how I, what I, I, I feel I introduced to the subject. And and what would you say is one way to get back into hearing that intuition? What's one way to get in? Um. I suppose it's 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 just a trusting trusting your own judgment in a sense or your own inner judgment. Um, and uh, trusting that you you are unique and therefore you're irreplaceable. There's never been a person like you ever on earth and there never will be ever in the future. You add to the world through your uniqueness uh, a, a specialness that no one else has, which is a gift to everyone you encounter. And it's your duty to do that. And therefore, don't marry yourself to institutions that tell you what to think or how to think. Um, reflect right. inwards uh, and allow yourself to to discover what your intuition is, because in fact your intuition is yourself at a spiritual le level guiding you through through your lifetime. Um, so well, I suppose that would be a reflection that one can do through mindfulness, one can do in, in all sorts of different ways. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I would just like to say Rick Lindor, Dr. Rick Lindor, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate it and um, I look forward to meeting you sometime in the future. Most definitely. Thank you. Okay, thank you.